Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Movie Geeks United Oscar nominee interview series 2014. Tonight we speak with Best Sound Editing nominee Richard Hems. For someone who entered the world of sound editing by happenstance, Richard Hems has crafted an extraordinary career that includes some of our most beloved films. He's won three Oscars for his work and many more nominations, including his latest for his stellar contribution to the Robert Redford Lost at Sea meditation, All is Lost. Other films that charm his resume include Saving Private Ryan, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Jurassic Park, Wild at Heart, Fight Club, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and The Right Stuff. This being in the service of an Oscar series, the first thing I'd like to know is you've, you've won, I believe, three times, and you've been nominated many more times. But by this point in your career, does it still kind of carry the same excitement, a nomination for you? Yes, it does. I, I, you know, I think it's always a thrill. Um, you know, the Academy luncheon was yesterday, and uh, that's always a uh, very exciting and supposedly casual affair. But obviously, with all those people there, it's <laughs> still very exciting. <laughs> yeah. And that was fun, and that's always fun. Um, and um, you know, it's just it's just a thrill to be nominated, especially for something like All Is Lost, which is such a small low budget affair that I, I really didn't expect anyone to notice it. Uh I, I did it for myself <laughs> the more than anything. There wasn't really any money in it and I, I just wanted to do it, you know. So the fact that it was noticed by my peers is incredibly flattering and exciting, yeah. Well the 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 challenge of uh, the excitement of the challenge involved in all is lost I mean, from from an outsider's perspective, would be obvious that you're dealing with one character uh, in in in, a, in, a, in an exotic setting, and there's no dialogue. I mean, it was was that the main thrust of the challenge for you? Um, more or less, yeah. I mean, it's just you know when uh, you've been in the business as long as I have, you start to sort of not really want to do the same old thing. You start looking around for something a little different, and this was one of those things. That I probably would not have even been on my radar at all because I don't, you know, I don't search the trades looking for films or anything really. I'm just not my style for whatever reason. I'm very bad at promoting myself. Um, and subsequently, don't work as often as uh, a lot of the top guys. Um, I'm just not, just not good at that sort of thing. But um, my, what happened was my wife Connie, um, who had worked for Robert Redford for about a decade prior to our marriage, um, and now works up here in the Bay Area. Um, we were getting married in Napa, and uh, at the time, Robert Redford was working there, and she said, well, you know, we've, well, it was a very small wedding, like literally 10 or 12 people um, at a little place that organized, uh, you know, weddings in, in a, uh, what do they call it, uh, elopement. Like honey, it, was not, it was like an elopement package, and so yes, you could only yes. have a maximum of 12 people. So she said, we've got to invite Bob and his wife because they're working there, and it would be insulting if we just ignored them. He said, she, he, said he probably won't come. He's much too busy. And he did come. God bless him. He was the first one there. And um, in the dinner, wedding dinner afterwards, he started talking about this film that was the biggest physical challenge of his life. And the more he talked about it being on a boat, I'm a sailor, and, and the fact there was no dialogue and there's going to be very little music, I was, I was salivating, not over the food, but over the chance to do this movie, you know. So finally I broke down and said, who the hell do I have to call to get on this film, you know. <laughs> it was very funny. I guess there's a few misconceptions about sound editing, and I want you to clear them up for me because for the layperson just watching a movie, they they assume that the sound that they're hearing was captured during that take, uh, and rightfully so because that's the impression that you want the moviegoer to have, that it's happening. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but how, what would you say is the percentage of of sound that's actually captured on the take? Well, uh, on this particular film um, – uh, they they did a great job of recording. Uh, the, the recordists on the set were, were were excellent. They did what they could, but of course the film is about boats being in a storm and things. And um, uh, they weren't in a storm and they were filming. Obviously, that would be insane to try and film during a storm. So all that is simulated in tanks, which have all the wrong sound for what we're looking for. So basically. Despite the fact that they did a very good job of recording, probably 95% of it or more was not really usable. 
There were a few things that were used here and there, but most of it was inappropriate, either wasn't loud enough or, or distinct enough to cut through the storm or whatever else was going on. The quiet lapping of the waves were, were, were recorded, but um, J.C. Chander, the director, quite rightly so, realized that he really did, the sound really wasn't very important to him while he was shooting. So he was talking over all of the takes, basically directing the crew, directing Robert Redford, and, and, you know, taking advantage of the fact that he was basically making a silent film to be able to coach people live, which is, you know, a, an opportunity that most directors don't have. So, yeah, basically, we were starting with a clean slate, a completely empty palette of sound, which is a great opportunity. You know, it's really just fantastic. The, you know, the small amount of dialogue I dealt with, and it was very simple to deal with. Well, I would imagine too that the, that your experience as a as a sailor uh, as a, uh, that would come in handy in terms of giving kind of specific directions about uh, no that that's what this sounds like or from this perspective uh, yeah. these are the sounds that you'd hear. Yeah, and Steve Bodecker, who was the sound designer on the film and did an absolutely wonderful job of mixing the film, um, relied on, relied on me heavily. He, he says he, say, he says it in, in, uh, all the time when we're talking. He just said, you know, it was just so great having me there to be able to say, well, what's happening off screen here? There's something happening. What is it? And I'd say, well, with the you know the jib sheet is changing sides, and so that, that that's the sound we would record. We actually what we did was there was a small craft warning in the in the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, warning all boats to stay out of the bay because the, the storm was going to be pretty bad. And so I called a friend of mine, and we got his uh, boat of a very similar size to the one in the movie, a similar type and size, same rigging and everything. And we, I took Steve Bodecker and Brandon Proctor, the other sound editor, uh, mixer on the film. It was only the three of us plus my assistant Andre on the whole film. It was an ter- incredibly low-budget film. I mean, not even cl- nowhere near close to six figures for the whole post-production, which is incredibly low. Mm. Um, you know, for the mixing and the crew and everything. So we went out in this boat uh, in this small craft warning. And it wasn't, you know, a storm like the one in the film, but it, it gave us enough of, uh, difficulties uh, with with wind and rain and spray and all the rest of it to be able to record things that were of a similar nature. You know, it was a really great opportunity. So we went out there and recorded for hours. I know when I speak to directors or, or say, cinematographers or actors, they – they usually can come up with a with a favorite moment from a film. Do you have one from a sound perspective of that film? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I do. I, 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 and it wasn't my work. It was um, actually Steve Bodecker's work. Um, I mean, I did some of, of it leading up to it, but the, there's a point where he climbs to the top of the mast, and you've got this very mm. strange sound of the. Um, attenuator on the top of the mast spinning and and some other clinking and clonking and he's plugging back in the radio cable that's gotten ripped off in the storm and then there's a rumble of thunder in the distance that's very ominous way too loud for reality but again we took that liberty in the film of believing that when you're alone on a boat and everything hinges on paying attention to everything that we we use that heightened sense of sound uh, and we, mm-hmm. we we sort of played everything up a little bit for redford's character is we're in his head more than anything and i love that moment i just think it's a tremendous moment of of, of doom and gloom <laughs> in a way just the realization that oh god here comes another one so the sounds in all is lost are they all uh natural sounds yes for the most part yeah i'm sure there are a couple of things that steve enhanced the film with with doing all kinds of tricks that we that we do you know in the way of slow down and rumbles but basically we started with um all natural sounds yeah i don't think there's anything particularly artificial except in the way they're manipulated you know, for the most part, there was one really funny thing I, uh, that we that we didn't use, but we we tried as a t- as a marker for it. Um, um, there's that that uh, tune, "I'm on a boat," and we Steve slowed it down about a thousand times till it was just <laughs> rumble and creak and stuff. <laughs> we didn't use it in the film, but it was very funny to just put it on there and look at it. It was cr- it cracked us all up. Uh, here, here's another misconception, uh, and and the, the sound editors that I've spoken to in years past, and sound mixers, they have varying opinions on this. But there there seems to be kind of a very thin line between editing and mixing, and uh, many of the people I've spoken to think it's a little silly to 
separate them in the Oscar category. Um, what's what are your feelings about that? Um, I'm kind of a dangerous ground here, but you know I'm I, I, I'm I'm known for putting my foot in my mouth from time to time. But yeah, <laughs> I, I I I feel the same way now. I uh, I I'm at the point where I. I mean, this film is a classic example. We had a sound designer that was also going to mix the film. It was all mixed in a Pro Tools room initially. You know, uh, Steve uh, told me that he wanted to mix the film in one piece, and I was totally thought it was a great idea. So we joined all the reels together and mixed it as a basically what originally started as a two-hour piece. I know the film came down quite a bit from that, but that's where we started. And it proved to be really helpful because we would have moments where you'd say. You know that sound in real one, that would be really good here. Uh, it might not be the exactly the same sound, but we could try it and see if it works and then find something similar. And you would just, you know, high speed, just jump digitally by punching in the footages to that place, grab it, move it back to the other place, and so on and so forth. You could refer to things so much quicker in the entire movie that way than I've ever done before. And then, so when we went to the stage to actually do the mix as a mixer on the proper board, everything was already in its own place and had been set at the correct level. We, had, we, we were 95% where we wanted to be, so that all we were left with in the final mix was making sure that J.C. Chandler was happy, that the, everybody was involved in it w was getting what they wanted. And we could do all the changes yeah. they wanted from that point. Actually, they were very happy with what they heard uh, anyway, so we didn't have to do a tremendous amount of, of changes. It, and it had to feel like you were flexing different muscles than a lot of the other films you've worked on, which which quite a few of them are some of the biggest movies ever made. Uh, they're, the, they're the muscular kind of action films. So, I mean, th this this had to be a complete kind of 180 for you, or or was it? Um, for me, well, this, you know, oddly for this film, because of the budget, I couldn't really be. I could, have, I could have done. Of course, I could have done a bit, done and been the guy in the trenches. But um, these two guys, Steve Bodecker and Brandon, are, are much faster di digitally cutting than I am. So I did do a lot of the sailboat stuff, editing, because that's my it was my area of expertise. But a lot of the other stuff I left to them because they are faster than I am. So they did the bulk of the editing. I would would say. Um, I did my I did um the, the sailing stuff I did a lot of editing. I supervised the Foley, which was done in Canada by a company called Footsteps, Andy Malcolm's company, which is a fantastic, fantastic group of people. Um for especially for a, a low budget project like this where I just couldn't really have the time to spend hands on. They I, they just said Andy just said to me, Just tell me what you don't want which is a fabulous thing when you're on a, on a very tight schedule. <laughs> you know, I just, and, and they did it all, and they edited it all in sync, and they sent it back to us and said, let us know if there's anything you don't like, and we'll redo it. And that's what we did. And they redid some things, and it was really wonderful. I supervised that and then did some editing, fine-tuning on it. When it came back, I went to um, a location I can't name because that's where Robert River lives, and we, we, <laughs> we used the soundstage there to record three days of breathing and effort noises because we, we, we had started to um, realize that we need, even though with, with all the noise you barely need it, we felt we needed a little of that kind of, that felt what was missing. And, and Robert was very concerned that he didn't want to become a movie about breathing and efforts, which I, I know exactly what he means. But at the same time, he didn't want us to use a, da a sound double, which we had started to do. So I went down and recorded all that with him. And, and to his credit, I mean, for a man of his age to do three days of breathing and cover a whole movie is astounding because mm. you can get very dizzy and hyper, you know, hyperventilate very easily whilst trying to do efforts and breathing noises. It's very easy to become... Very dizzy, and and he's he must be, he must have done it for years or something because he just didn't 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 get out of breath once. He just knows how to do it, and and that was fantastic. And then I edited all that, but the bulk of the you know the what I would call the sound effects editing was done by uh, Steve and and Brandon. They did a terrific job. What what was the appeal of of sound to you when you first started trying to get into the business? Um. That's another one of those really weird stories. Um, I started in the film industry uh, by mistake, basically. Um, I just I was trying to be 
I didn't know what I wanted to be. And my father was an accountant in the, in, in the, uh, one of the studios in Elstree where I grew up, which happened to be a, a film community. You know, there's two, two or three studios in that area where I grew up. Um, and so he was very concerned about where I was going. I was a bit of a tear away at 15. I left school at 16 after being expelled. And uh, uh, I was involved in a gang. And it was, it was all looking kind of very... Very troublesome from my dad's point of view. I thought it was great at the time. I thought I was a moron like most people <laughs> at 16. <laughs> and um, he said, what do you want to do? And I didn't have any ideas. So we went down to the studio, uh, and there was a notice board, um, which is the way things were done then. There weren't really film schools in the early 60s or anything like that. And there was a sign on there for a T-boy in the editing department. And... Um, that's how I got started. Um, I had the idea was my idea was that I wanted to be a clapper loader um, and then go to be, be, be go on to become a cameraman. Um, I subsequently became fascinated by editing just by because I was making tea for these guys, um, and then I got a break to work on the Saint TV series as that tea boy. Um, so as a picture editing was now my main focus. I'd forgotten about the camera department. I'd sort of looked into it a bit more. And when I got to know more about what it involved, I wasn't very interested in it. Um, so picture editing began to focus. And then when I moved to San Francisco, and this is like 15 years into my career you know, uh, in England, I moved to San Francisco when I got married. Um, and I did a film. I did. Uh, I just happened to move to the Bay Area at, a, at the time that when the town was evolving. You know, like uh, uh, film-wise, uh, Apocalypse Now had just started. Uh, Black Stallion had just started in the editing phase. Uh, so I arrived right then, and there was nobody in this town that was really had any experience. I mean, they well, both of those films were crewed mainly by people from Los Angeles, England, and New York. So. I, I got there a little too late to be on the main crew, but I got hired as a beginner, as it were, in the picture editing department on those films. And then I worked for Alan Parker. I did Shoot the Moon and Birdie, based out of here too, which were both um, uh, being done from, from uh, in this area. Um, and what happened was when they, so I sort of established myself in San Francisco, and now what was happening was I wasn't getting any work, and I looked at it, and the picture became clear that if you're going to be a picture editor, I'd really have to move to L.A., which I didn't want to do. I had lived there a little bit in my past, and I, it wasn't my thing. So I, uh, if I was going to stay, I had to switch to sound. And so I switched to sound really to stay employed, and my career went through the roof. Basically, because, like I said, there wasn't that many experienced people here at the time, and I proved to be very good at it, much to my surprise. So um, I was very really serendipitous, so leaps of faith, I call them. Weird leaps of faith in my life that have just made my <laughs> my world it's a, just it's great. Amazing how, great it's, amazing you know? how li li it's amazing how life works out sometimes. I mean, the, but it really is, just like they say, the the, the preparation meets opportunity. And uh, I guess you just arrived at, at just the right time because those were just incredibly exciting films and exciting directors that you're talking yes. about with the Alan, Par Alan Parker films. And then, and then you've also worked uh, in the past with David Lynch, um, which you think of those uh, terrific images in Lynchian films, but, but it's un you can't separate them from the sound. I mean, the sound creates such a dreamscape in those films and my favorite film actually is wild at heart is there anything you can tell me about the experience of working on that particular film um yes it's rather mundane the, the particular thing that comes to mind for me but um and and probably a bit negative but that's, that's typical of me um i was david had gone, wanted this very specific um thunderbird sound for the car with um uh these special exhausts and all sorts of things. And because I was English and, and not very uh, into American cars even at all, I had a great deal of trouble pleasing him. I, I, don't, I really felt like I failed on that film. I never got the sound he quite wanted with the glass packs and all that. I really wasn't able to satisfy him. But, you know, that was just one aspect, aspect of uh, my uh, struggle on that film. Uh, for the most part, that film was... Um, gruelingly challenging we, we again we didn't have uh, the budget or the schedule for the kind of things we were trying to reach but uh and alan splett who was the sound designer for david who i i worshipped and and taught me an awful lot of, of about sound that i 
even though I'd been in business a long time, I hadn't even thought of. He was way, way out there. <laughs> you know, I've been very, very lucky with you know Ben Burt, Alan Splett, uh, mm. um, Gary Reisden. These people are in a, in, a, in a league of their own in terms of their creativity. I've just been so blessed to be able to work with them and learn so much from them. Uh, and they're, they're, they're really, really been terrific people to work with. And, uh, and all, my, all my career, I've been, been around people that have taught me so much. But um, yeah, Wild at Heart was, was, was a fantastic movie. I, I, so many things about that. I can't even think of one sp- specific sound or thing that was particularly challenging other than just be working with David was like that. He would just present you with these challenges all the time. Yeah. And and before I let you go, I have to ask about the, you know, when I announced that you were going to be on the show, uh, a lot of our listeners brought up Saving Private Ryan. Um, and, you know, speaking of underwater and all is lost, I, I think a sound that really stays with people it is it is the invasion at the beginning and and the submersing underwater and above water and the sound of gunfire through the through the water how did you happen upon that um that, that's great that, that i mean it's just wonderful that people remember those things it, it's really it's a wonderful film and i did um i didn't the two pieces I did, people always bring up, which is also really gratifying. I did the opening scene up to, um, you know, where they're up at the beach and he's looking up around the corner with the mirror. That was the first segment I did up to that battle, the end of that battle, basically. And also the tank scene at the at the end of the movie from, you know, basically the last scene where they're, they're doomed. Um, so and on all the vehicles in the in the rest of the movie too. But those two scenes people always bring up, and it makes me so happy. Um, the underwater thing was was uh, again uh, something I was uh, fascinated by. I had um, I had uh, I had done a lot of scuba diving, and I was talking to Gary Rose, and I was saying, you know, I want to try some stuff with this because. Um, Underwater, you don't have a perspective underwater. There, you know, things aren't relative to what's happening. In other words, an outboard motor coming from 250 yards away when you're 50 feet underwater sounds like it's two feet away. And you can hear the sand shifting on the bottom of the water. And yet things always in film are played muffled. And I said, let's not go there. Let's, play, let's have the boat engines be pretty loud. So that they're there when these people are underwater, you can hear the motors, you can hear things moving. You know the the the, uh, the rifle hitting the bottom of the of the of the the water. That, those are things you hear distinctly, and other things are muffled. So we really leaned into the contrast between above water and below water, which um, obviously Stephen had set up because unfortunately in sound. 99% of what you do has to be set up by the director. The, the idea of the saxophone playing in the apartment next door through the wall, you know, stuff is terribly difficult to pull off. It's really, it's really, it's, it's really a fact that you really need a director who's, who's into sound to pull these things off. So Stephen has set it up, and we just went to town with that. And uh, I, I love that scene too. Um, the underwater bullets was Gary's design. Uh, he, he has uh, talked about that quite a bit about how he made those. The one that sticks to mind is the the underwater bullets going into the body was actually a sound effect from <laughs> a river runs through it, uh, which was the <laughs> casting fly uh, uh, swishing of the, the rod got flying out, uh, reversed, and then, you know, all the top, all, sorry, all the bottom taken out, so they, <laughs> instead of the reverse, which was the cast. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah, and and and, and I I certainly I when, I mean Gary told me that I was as flabbergasted as anybody else because I didn't recognise the sound which I had edited in River Runs through it. <laughs> 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 and hearing you talk about these projects, I, I suppose like the major consideration for a sound designer would be the the perspective, the point of view, establishing a, uh, the the character's point of view. Yes. Exactly. You have to, dis- you know, again, this is what the director wants ultimately, but you have to, you know, know what the point of view is going to be. I mean, Private Ryan was the victim's point of view. It was shot that way and it feels that way. You know, it's, it's about the bullet buys. It's not about the machine guns uh, in foreground so much. It's more about what's happening on the beach at the other end. 
and yeah. uh, that was different. That was definitely different, and that's that's a point of view that was that really worked in that film. The Robert Redford film, All Is Lost. I think it could have gone either way. You could have be, you could have you could have made it much more literal, and uh, uh, and it wouldn't have been anywhere near as exciting. I don't think making it all from his point of view and his head right inside his head kind of an aspect that we chose to try and take. I think really really made it much more powerful. I think so too. Yeah. I I am crazy about the work that you you do and and you've contributed to so many movies that that I just adore. So thank you so much uh for your thank work you. and 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 thank you for giving me time to talk about it and and best of luck to you on Oscar night. I'll be I'll be cheering for you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>